Wow, it's really exciting now. About four years ago, this started off as being just this little nothing of a thing. Two years later, it started growing and growing and growing and growing. People started becoming more aware of what was going on. The third year, it got bigger and bigger. And last year, we started thinking, how can we get more people to come here? You know, because we've only had local poets. And we wanted to see what it would be like to have some people come out of town. So we wrote a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts. They gave us some funds. And now we're really excited because on this fourth year, we're going to be bringing people in from all over the country. And the first one, I'm not going to explain or introduce. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a mind right now. <laughs> First of all, we'd like to thank the New York State Council on the Arts for giving us the funds for our Deaf Poetry Series. It's a very valuable contribution. We'd like to thank Writers and Books for allowing us to use this space for the last few years. We'd like to thank Jim Cohen, who's a hearing poet, who saw the possibilities of Deaf Poetry in Rochester, and he kind of gave us the kick, gave us the start. So we'd like to dedicate tonight to him. Stand up, Jim. <laughs> and Miriam Nathan, who isn't here because she took over some interpreting duties for Susan Quinlan so that Susan could meet with our poet this evening. And she took over some kind of an engineering class or something. So, we should shut up. One more, one more and I'll shut up. Voicing tonight will be Susan Quinlan. Did I spell that right? And for the cold seat will be Marie Bernard. And now the person who will introduce will be Robert Panera. He's been teaching at NTID. He was the first deaf teacher in the area to uh, English and drama and all kinds of things. He's really been into it for a long time. And he was a poet in Gallaudet. He's been good friends with Mollis from a long time, so we'd like to have him introduce. Came to 
R I T and N T I D. They two days we had a wonderful workshop with him. And that was made possible mostly through hmm, Zoom account. Who a while ago paid it and produced him to you. Zoom Cohen was really a friend of that famous poet, Alan Ginsberg, and was a student. And he brought him to Rochester. And a wonderful experience with him. Peter was in that class, very excited. And I think the dream, the worm of the idea, and the mind began to and the future of that poet and them two together. And then about a month ago, and the famous writer, Oliver Sacks, spoke at NTID and had the opportunity to introduce him. And again, the next day, he came here to speak. I couldn't make it. Conflict from before. I was there to do that the last minute. But now, I'm very happy that I can make it here. I see this place, ooh, I see why it's so successful. I see all the cars parked. <laughs> took a long time to park. <laughs> I got a regular puzzle tonight to speak a little bit about our guest, Eric Miles Coon. Now, from Washington, D.C., and MSSP, began way back in 1940. 1940, before many of you were born, I was at Canada, Canada University. No student, and Miles Cohn was mm, two years ahead of me. Mm. He teased me. Oh, ho, <laughs> ho. And after a while, we found we had a lot of things in common. Loved poetry, loved drama, loved mm, baseball. <laughs> and many things happened. And I remember Gallagher had a literary club called LF Literary Society every month. Different students would volunteer, practice, memorize poetry, short story, part of a play on the stage. Mm -hmm. We had a contest. Mm -hmm. One time, Miles Cohn came in my room at night. He said, Bob, I want to show you something. Mm -hmm. I mean to act out on a Friday night for the LS. I sat on the bed in my room. <laughs> Mm. Ooh, ah, ah, I knew the poem, but never saw anybody sign that. Never believed anybody could sign that. The Jabberwocky from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I fell off the bed laughing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, mm. The faculty advised 
Same as Tom Holcomb, he knows. Sometimes when he's signing, going crazy, he falls down too. But, but it's not as easy as it looks. So if I fall down, please have a pretty girl help me get up. Is that clear? Okay, so now if you notice, where is he? There he is. Bob Panera stole half of my speech. That's all right. I'm going to correct some of the things he said, though. I'm going to tell you a story about Broadway. That's me. <laughs> I really don't feel comfortable with that. <laughs> That's better. Okay, is everybody ready? Wait. <laughs> Miles. How did I get my name? Well, I'll tell you, it was, let's see, about 17 years ago. Well, first of all, when I went into college, well, well let me see, I'll tell you. So do people still use your full names? Do you, do you know my full name? I used to. I used to tell people my full name. <laughs> Frederick Mouse Coon. Mr. Eric Frederick. Mr. People would say, I have to call you that? I'd say, ah, you don't have to call me Mr. But that's my full name. So I had to spell out I am. The goddamn Eric Mouse Coon from the goddamn state of California. And I finger spelled all of it. So I would do that all the time, and then finally it seemed that Mal's became enough. So I stopped. And I liked it. So Mal's was enough. It's a lot easier. And then about 17 years ago, I went to a meeting for RID. And I was taking care of the money for Washington's RID. And a woman, a single woman, she wasn't married yet. And she had an adopted son, a very nice little boy. He was a black boy, and he was deaf. And the woman was white. And the mother introduced me to the little boy and said, that's Mr. Miles. And he only used the letter M and made a Z with it. So Miles has been my name sign. So hello, I am Miles. I'm happy to be here. I'm going to go back in time, but 
I, first, I want to know if I'm doing a good job or not, or if the interpreter is doing a good job or not. <laughs> so, okay, I feel better now. <laughs> if I only saw three, I might worry a little bit, but I saw four, so I guess it's okay. So, can you turn up your volume a little bit? Can you speak a little bit louder? Okay, that's, that's just perfect. Okay. So now I want to explain a little bit about me. When I was small, I was hearing, you know, like this. And then when I got a little bit older, oh, I lived in California, it was a small town. And I went to the same doctor while I was growing up. And he was only about a, one, a block away so I could walk there to see him. And you know, he'd give me the complete physical and, and test everything. And it was really easy for me. So everything was fine, I was happy and I'd go see him regularly, and... And then something was wrong, and so he decided he needed to buy a bigger practice, and it meant moving far away. So I lost him. And so I had to find another doctor. Well, not hang on to that, okay? So then about, let's see, two, three months later, I became deaf. <laughs> My ears were turned off, and it happened during the night. I got sick, it just happened. I, I was taken to the hospital, and the way that it found out is because my father always read the, the newspaper to me, the comics, and my mother would tell me, go, go let your father read to you. And my dad told me, stop whispering. Or I told my father, stop whispering, and my, my father was surprised, and he, he thought something was wrong, so he took me to the hospital because he was speaking normally. <laughs> In the morning, the nurse came in, and she left the blinds up on the window, and she said, good morning, and the eye heard nothing, and only saw her lip movements. It felt just like a silent movie. There was no sound. I was devastated. It hit me immediately that, ah, my, my hearing had left me. I could hear nothing. I didn't hear when the blinds went up on the window. So that's important. Remember that, too. So then for two years, I read everything. My father didn't want me to go to a school for the deaf. He didn't know where to send me. And when I he did find a school for me, I felt like I was plopped into this new environment. I wanted people to help me, but I didn't know any sign language. It was really awful. I was bitter and frustrated. And then one day, I caught my first sign. I loved it. What was... Suppose there was a boy there, and he signed what to me? Bat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was curious to know, what does that mean when you look at him? And he told me it meant yes. I was thrilled. Oh, wow, my first sign. So I thought, okay, school's not so bad. And the teachers would say, Eric, did you know what it meant? And the teachers didn't know what it meant. <laughs> I was surprised that the teacher had asked me what to say. I had just learned sign. I had been hearing myself. But I realized that it was a deaf sign, and that's why. Anyway, so the teachers who worked there didn't sign very fluently. They signed uh, enough to get by. It was awful. It was really horrible. It was a slow process for me. And it seemed that the others were going to learn really quickly. And for me, it took forever. But I hung in there until... Also, I was very shy at that time. I, I was a simple person. But the only thing that, that I really loved when I was young was playing football. But I couldn't. I was too young. The other kids would think I was really smart because I could write really well. And I thought, oh, that's no big deal. And they tended to avoid me. I was really lonely. But I kept on reading and writing and suffering and hanging in there. And then later, my teacher said that next month there was going to be a senior play. And I thought, what do you mean? Well, why are you telling me there's going to be a play? Me. And the teacher said, you know, I want you to act. And I thought, me? On the stage? People looking at me? No way. I can't. 
I felt that maybe I had a heart attack and died. <laughs> Just the thought of it, no thanks. And the teacher smiled and said, well, if you want to graduate, then I said, wait a minute. If you're going to put it that way, then I guess I'll have to change my mind. I do want to graduate, so OK, I'll be on the stage. But guess what? We had to create the play ourselves. So I thought, wow, I have to make up my own thing. So that, this was in 1938. And when I was finished performing, the kids all came up to me and said, wow, that was great. I like that. That was the first time they paid any attention or gave me any kind of praise. So that continued with me from 1938 till now. For a long time. So I went into Gallaudet, and in my freshman year, Bob already told you about Jabberwocky when I made up that poem, when I translated it. It's, some of it are some real signs, and they were good signs a long time ago, but some of it was different, like these sort of hand movements, maybe like water. But I did some of my own hand movements, and I really had no coordination, so I knew that I needed to just go ahead and let go and try it. I wanted to be involved in things there, and, and I knew I didn't really have the skill. So I searched inside of myself for something that I could perform, and I found the poem. And it seemed, well, it was interesting. It was nothing I had ever, ever seen before. So I showed it to Bob, and signed it for him, and he was totally in awe. The other people also were really shocked and asked me, what are you doing? And I'd show them the poem, and they'd say, but it doesn't mean anything. And I'd say, I'm signing exactly nothing, and the poem means exactly nothing. But I was very successful with it. Another boy did beat me in the contest that Bob was talking about. His poetry poem was about a bow going in water and being inspired. And, but after that, I was invited to perform it, and he wasn't. So I guess if he was successful anyway, I was in a way. So I traveled and performed and did Jabberwocky. Then later, during my sophomore year, I was in Arsenic and Old Lace. So do you want to know why I picked that play? Because I wanted something new at Gallaudet. They always tended to do the same old kind of thing. You know, like when you go down to the diner and you get the blue plate, plate spencer, I'm proud of it. Put some kind of sauce on top of it. I wanted something new, something thrilling. So I had read that play during the summer, the summer before my ju junior year, not 43, 42, Bob. And I read it right before my junior year, and it seemed to fit what, what I was looking for. So I showed it to some people at Gallaudet and explained my ideas. And everybody thought, nope, you can't do it. And there was a vote. It was five to one. And the one person didn't count, so we kicked him out. So I sent a letter to the writers and said, I'd like to use this play. And they sent it back and said, sorry, no. It's not available for any production of any play until it had been on Broadway. I was furious. So I typed a letter. Back. And it's the other one from my typewriter. And I mailed the letter back to them and said, Well, what about me? I'm, I'm one of the best sign language actors in the world. And it seemed that the letter was given to somebody who was higher up on the totem pole, and we were accepted. It went through a telegraph system, a, a postal system, not like what we have today. But they said, fine, we'd like for you to do it, and we'd like for you to use our set, and to do so in February. And I was in Washington, D.C. at the time. And I thought, wow, am I supposed to take control here and get things set up? <laughs> oh my god, I didn't expect that. I thought, I have to act in it and take charge of it? No way. But I thought about it, and some other, I made some other phone calls, and, and it seemed like there was enough time that it was postponed until June, so, so there was enough time. 
And I told them, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstand you. February is not enough time. We need to practice. So they told us to go ahead and practice it. And, and when we were finished, then we could come to Broadway and do it at the Fulton Theater. Mm. I thought, Broadway? Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> All my life, I've always thought that the best theater is on Broadway with the lights around the marquee. And I thought, I can't take this. This is silly. So I picked someone who would be really the best director. Do you know? He's a small man. Fred. Frederick. Frederick. Hughes. Hughes. Frederick Hughes. Jim McGavin. The, the Jim McGavin is named after him. He was a champion in football about 1920s, 30s. He was the coach when the football team was, was champions. So anyway, I ran and knocked on his door and explained the situation. And I said, look at me, look at me, I, I, I want to explain this. And, and he was saying, well, uh, um, I asked him, can you help me? Before he had been in the club with us, he had helped us set it. Bob was in it too. It Really, there was no drama major at that time, so it wasn't a class, it was a club. So I said, would you help us? Yeah. And he said, what? And I was so nervous, I could barely get it out. And I said, well, the drama club wants to give a play, um, and we're wondering if you could direct it. And he said, no. <laughs> Me? What? Oh. I teach all day, I'm so busy, I'm sorry. I, I'd like to appreciate it, but I can't. And I said, well, <laughs> oh, my hair stood up, rock my phone down to it. So, I guess we got him. Then I met the president of the hall and asked him for permission, and I explained the situation. And he said, no, sorry, no. Whoa. And I said, why? Are you afraid that we're going to go to New York and ruin it? Broadway is professional. And he said, they're going to make fun of you. I was boiling inside. <laughs> there was smoke. I was so upset. Do you know Jonathan Hall? Have you heard of him before? Do you know him? He's the son of President Hall. So I asked him to organize a meeting of the faculty and staff. So there was a meeting and they all voted, yes, we'll go. So first we went to New York and just to discuss business. That was with Howard, Lindsay, and Russell Krupp. So we just talked business with him. We were using, staying in a hotel. It was really kind of nice, it was expensive. And we would go to their office to talk business. And they said, are you gonna go to the play? And then when you're finished, when we're done, you can come to our dressing room after the play tonight and we'll talk more. And um, when you go eat in the hotel, just sign our names on the credit. That's all. Just go ahead. And, and we thought, wow. So we were so excited that night. And we ordered everything that we could. It was really sophisticated and fancy. And then when we were finished, they brought the check to us. And we brought out our <laughs> Very technically signed his name. The waiter looked at it looked us up and down <laughs> and said, I've never seen you before. So the waiter went and called <laughs> and found out that we really were <laughs> with the writers and then he was very nice to us. And, and that was the first time in my life and the, one, the only time in my life that I felt I was of an upper social class. 
So we were in the third row center at the play that night. It was really the best seat in the house. During the first act, the Russell Crowe came down the aisle and he waved to us. Is everything all right? He asked. So just fine. And everybody looked at us and thought, who's that? Wow, that must be important. I felt like we were bursting. I felt so proud. Then when the play was done, we went and discussed business some more. Talked about what time things would happen and, and all of that. And then Frederick said, do you want a drink? And, and I said, sure, I'll have a whiskey sour, even though I was only 19. And, and you know that it was forbidden that I would drink a Gallaudet. So, um, <laughs> what did you give me? No. And Howard said, oh, I'll go ahead, no big to tell. So, we went ahead and ordered beer. <laughs> All right, so we went and rehearsed, and then when it was time to perform in New York, we came and acted, and what Bob said was successful. I did get to, oh, I did not borrow Boris Karloff's shoes. He asked me if I wanted to use his lucky shoes, but they were size 13 and I only wear size 10. And I said, oh, fine, fine, so he gave them to me, but they were too big. <laughs> Walk at him and he asked me, do they fit? And I said, oh, fine. Why were they lucky? Because he used them the first time he had become famous. So ever since then, he'd used them. They had been his lucky shoes. He said, Mouse, tomorrow you can use my dressing room. Use my shoes. You can use my costume. And I'll make you up. And maybe a volume would help you. Oh, a ballet. It was a little bit silly that I couldn't do it myself, but it seemed to be the polite thing to do. Thank you, Ben. I went ahead and act, and it was successful. My pictures were all over the place, all over in the U.S. My head was getting big, you know. But what do you think happened? When it was over, I came back to Washington C and I got in a fight with my, girl, <laughs> my girlfriend. Boy, did my head shrink back to its normal size. <laughs> and she made me feel small again, you know what I mean? She insulted me, and then my head went right back to where it was before. But anyway, then my senior year at Gallaudet, you remember I told you about the doctor that I visited regularly when I was a child? Okay. It happened during the summertime and it was the summer before my senior year. I got a letter that said that I needed to go to, uh, I need to report for my physical for World War II. I thought, well, fine, I'll go. So I went, and the doctor for my physical was the same one that had been my doctor when I was a child. I thought, wow, I've known him, this is fine. And he talked, I lip read him, it was easy. And my voice was still normal because I had lost my hearing when I was 10, so by the time I was 20, I still spoke the same. He asked me how was college, I said fine, checked me over and let me go. And at that time, the president was, I was president of the student body. I was the president for the, the student body of the boys at Canada. And I got a letter that said, please report to uh, what A? Because the physical was one A. I thought, me? One A? I was shocked. And the doctor who had signed it was the one that I had known when I was young. And I thought, oh no, I, should I tell people or, or what? I, I mean, I can't challenge the U.S. Army, can I? I mean, I, I go to Germany? Maybe I'll become a general. Well, that'd be hard. Well, okay, then a lieutenant. So I went, and I thought maybe I'll go to Germany and take over Hitler. <laughs> 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 mustache off. 
<laughs> so I did go, and the first place that I went to, I was sitting in the first row. And I saw him say, Mal's coon. I raised my hand, I passed. <laughs> and the next thing was that I had to go to Fort Meade. And lines were <laughs> extremely long and turning all around the corners. It was awful. Do you think that the armies let people take a break? Never. They're always working. So I stayed in lines and was patient. And they used a stick. <laughs> Gave me a stick with a nail in it to pick up papers and, and trash. Off. So I didn't mind. I walked around and picked up papers, threw them in the garbage. And some of the some of the soldiers were playing football, and I loved it. So I watched for a while, and somebody came up to me. Someone was striking his arm and asked me, "Are you off?" And I said, "No." And he yelled. And even though I didn't hear it, I knew he was yelling at me. He came closer to me, yelling and yelling. And I hadn't heard it. I thought, oh, a little breeze near my ear. And then he started tapping me on the shoulder. And I said, sorry. And he said, are you deaf or something? Well, yes. What? You goddamn liar. You've got to get out of the army. I'll fix you. So he took me to the doctor, and I got to cut in the line, and he said something to the doctor. And the doctor looked me up and down and said, mm-hmm. I don't know what they were saying. So the doctor called me over and told me to take off my clothes. So I did. And I left my briefs on him and told me, I said, take off all your clothes. <laughs> the doctor walked around me, and everybody was looking at me, because everybody was new to having a physical student, and they were all laughing. The doctor walked around me again and said, yes, you're dead, put your, dad, put your clothes back on, you go home. Now, how did he know by looking at me knew that I was dead? Well, anyway, so I put my clothes back on. First, I talked with one of the sergeants, and he told me I needed to go see someone with two stripes. And I was going up and up the line of rank of order, and said, and finally I was told I had to be able to hear 20 feet away, and I had no right to be there. So they told me I could go to work in a war factory. So I went back to Gallaudet. <laughs> my tail was beneath my my legs as I went back to Gallaudet. And I saw another man who had been in line with me. He had got kicked out too. Why? Because he had flat feet. So I wrote a note to him and said, why did the doctor, why did the doctor throw me out? How did he know I was dead? And the man said, easy, because he walked behind you. And he said, sorry, buddy. <laughs> I have to stick with what I feel about my family. And I didn't show any reaction. Of course, if I was hearing, I would have had some sort of pain on my face. So that's how I knew I was deaf for sure. So, that's how the doctor helped me so that my army career was only one day. But believe me, it was one full day. Full day. From morning to night. Okay. Now, I want to show you some of my poetry, and I'm going to start with Jabberwocky. Do you want to see it? But first of all, I'd like to explain. This won't be the same. <laughs> the 
this will be the same as what you see Lufan do. Because with his body and his face, it just looks real different. But for myself, I do it a little bit differently every time. And sometimes I'm wonderful. And sometimes I stay, to be honest with you. But really, it depends on my mood. So like with my wife this morning, she was giving me, oh, when she wakes me up, she says, Eric, your coffee is ready. And sometimes I look like this when I wake up, so that's what my animal looks like. <laughs> but then sometimes she says, yeah, man, you bastard, you're white. And then my animal looks like this, and I pounce out of bed. So, gee, I wonder what my mood is tonight. So you guys ready? Was brillig and the slithy toes, the gyre and gimbal in the way. <laughs> All mimsy were the borogoves and the mummerath of gray. <laughs> Beware the jabberwock. My son, his jaws that bite, his claws that scratch. <laughs> Beware the jub jub bird <laughs> and shun the frumious bandersnatch. <laughs> Took his borehole sword <laughs> and long time the manx and foe he sought. And so he stood under the tum tum tree in thought. While in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock. With eyes of flame, came whiffling through the Tulgy wood. And the purple as it came. One and two, through and through, the forful blade went snicker snack. He took its head and left it dead, and went. went galumphing back. <gasps> Thou hast slain the Jabberwock. Oh, come to my arms, you my beamish boy. Kalu, Kalei. <laughs> he chortled in his joy. It was brilliant, and the slippy toes. Did gar and gimble in the way, <laughs> all mimsy were the morrow groves and the morass out gray. <laughs> Detroit. You all know where Detroit is. Detroit, Michigan. And you know what that town is famous for? Uh, yeah, of course. Their automobiles. <laughs> and so this is what my animal looked like. The lights and the smoke billowing out the back. So it really depends upon where I go. <laughs> so I'm going to take a break. And I'd like to play a game with you. And I hope you appreciate this game. And don't sit on your hands. I'm going to ask you to be attending and participating in this game. Me. I know you guys will all enjoy this when the joke's on somebody else, but when I pick on you, please don't jump out. 
This is a game I use for teaching sign language and drama and English. All three of these. Could you help me out here? Okay, can I have your attention back up here? Eyes directed up to the front. I want to explain how this game works. Usually I use this with a small group. Or five and five, or six and six. And this is a game for all ages. You'll, you'll see how it works as it goes along. You'll be challenged, but you can't sign and you can't speak. Okay? But, but I'll, I'll show you all how it works. So you can sign. You can do whatever. You know, I'll ask you to do a few things and let's go. First, first I'll show you one of these. If I show you this, oh, and then I'll show you the verb, and then obviously me, I'm pointing to me, but I, but I can't sign mine, and I can't sign my whatever. Okay, never mind. Well, you have to stop me. No, you don't understand what's going on. Okay, fine. Just stop me. I'm unflappable. You guys ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Don't hide your hands. Who wants to volunteer? Yeah. 
You guys got the idea now? Okay. All right, I want people to volunteer in here. Okay. You get the idea of what I'm trying to do here. Sure. I'm trying to give you, you yourselves, the opportunity to be creative. <laughs> I know why you sit on your hands, okay? Okay, this is the last one. That's a hard one. Come on, come on, come on. 
<laughs> Change a little bit. Uh-huh. Yeah, spell that. Newspaper. John. They talk about John Doe. Hey. What's what comes after John Doe? Myself to keep myself awake. 
<laughs> but it was no good. I'd go out every day. Then one day, he got even with me. I went out, as usual. And I woke up. He was <laughs> There was a story going on up front, but it wasn't my class. <laughs> <laughs> my whole class had gotten up and left me there. So, so I was extremely embarrassed. And I and, and the teacher came up to me and said, Mr. Mouse, may I suggest tomorrow that you bring a pillow? <laughs> Crawled out of the room. But anyway. I want to show you how you can change a poem. And we're going to do one called The Cat. First, I'll sign it in PSE. And then, I'll sign it in ASL. And then, and I'll sign it. In The trouble. <laughs> Kittens is that eventually it becomes a cat. The trouble with a kitten is that eventually it becomes a cat. I, I think that's a little bit bad. The trouble with kittens is that eventually it becomes a cat. <laughs> you have to change and play with the language. Now we have another example called the centipede. The sign that you use for a centipede, what is it around here? Huh, okay. That's a good one. I'll sign this for centipede. Okay? We objurgate the centipede, a bug we really do not need. At sleepy time, it beats paths straight from the bedroom to the bath. And if we stop, there it is not. And if it is, it makes a spot. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need the centipede. At sleepy time, it beats a path to, into the bath. If we stomp, there it is now. There <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> it can be a little different. Now I want to work on a poem that I made up myself. And we call this San Francisco. Have you ever been to San Francisco? One, two, few of you? Okay. So here I'm trying to show you how to use finger spelling. And finger spelling can be incorporated into a poem. What does San Francisco have? The bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. Bridge, what else does it have? The hilly streets. Bay. Right, there's a bay. San Francisco Bay, hilly streets, um, fog, okay, and cable cars, okay. I first wrote this poem in 1966. It was, it was when I was working for a play with NTD and we were in San Francisco. Bob saw it at that time, but I've changed it over the years. I think it's improved too. So here we go with finger spelling. San Francisco. You are not a city. You are a dream. Your people are not what they seem. 
Your people are princes and kings who come from all over the world to do fabulous things in San Francisco. Your very elegance, the way your people dance, your up and down streets with their mixture of Chinese and Italians and Greeks, your crazy cable cars, your restaurants, give a touch of romance to you, San Francisco. San Francisco, you will never grow old. You are frozen in time, a city alone, a sonnet of sand and stone with a sea splashed rhyme. San Francisco. <laughs> Beloved dream of mine. Beautiful. Okay, I'd like to share a secret with you. I have a health problem. I have Malzheimer's disease. Have you heard of it? Malzheimer's disease? It means that my mind is uh, a little bit shot. You saw that when I showed you Jabberwocky. You know, the first time I showed it, a third of the audience thought I was genius. The other one third thought I was insane. And the last third couldn't really decide which. <laughs> so, hang in there with me. And now I want to have a young lady volunteer to come up here. Who would do that? Come on. Somebody volunteer? Anybody? You? Okay. nations would I bring to kneel before your scepter and swear allegiance to your eyes, your lips and hair. Beneath your feet 
What treasures would I have? <coughs> you would have the sun and the moon to wear. The stars your necklace on a string. The world a ruby for your finger ring. <laughs> King. Let those wild words and wilder dreams take wing. Deep in the woods, I hear a shepherd sing, a simple ballad for the sylvan air, a love that always finds your face more fair. I could not wish for thee any godlier thing if I were king. King, oh Lord, if I were king, what tributary nations would I bring to kneel before your scepter and to swear allegiance to your eyes, your lips, your mouth? <laughs> Beneath your feet, what treasures I would bring. You would have the sun and the moon to wear. <laughs> I am King Henry VIII. How many wives do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Their name is Legion. Why? Yeah, because I killed a few of them, that's right. And this is part of a play that I acted. And this is just before King Henry VIII proclaims his will to have Anne beheaded. So are you ready? Shall I go on? Okay. This is so hard to do. When you come to put pen to paper, Anne must die. She must. If things are to go as planned. Yes, if they're to go at all. <coughs> if I am to rule. And keep my sanity. And hold my England off the rocks. It's a lee shore and a low tide. And the winds are raw. The 
Spanish rocks are bare and sharp. Go back to it, Henry. Go back to it. <laughs> Keep your mind on this parchment you must sign. You've condemned men, nobles, and peasants. She's struck down a few herself. Or driven you to do it. It's only that a woman held in your arms and longed for when she was away and suffered with her and waited for the outcome of her childbed? No, she promised me an heir. Write it down. And when the headsman will cry out suddenly, look, look there. And point to the first flash of sunrise and she'll look, not knowing what it means. <coughs> and a sword will flash in the flick of the sun through the little bones in her neck as she looks away. And it will be done. What will it seem to men? <coughs> I was like when I did this. It'll be written and studied. The history of kings are never secure. The letters they have hidden, secret ciphers are unraveled and chuckled over. He loved her and he had her and he killed her. The letters will be printed, but one of the stolen love letters where I played the fool, and there's a heart drawn at the bottom of one, and in the heart, A, B, laboriously printed. Henry Rex seeks A, B, and no other. her less and less. She loved me more, but she betrayed me. Even in my anger, she betrayed me. did this was now working for Disney and he worked many many years and was very very frustrated and oh and he's been drawing cartoons ever since so let me show you this <laughs> This isn't only for me.
very much for coming tonight. We really enjoyed it. And there's going to be some more deaf poetry coming up soon. So watch for the advertisements. And if you want to sign up our mailing list, <laughs> Put your names down here, please. And we'll send you some notes when we're going to have more deaf poetry. There's all different kinds of people coming up. There's going to be a couple people from Montreal in Canada. They're going to do some French poetry for us, so we're bringing them in in January, I think. And so put your names down, we'll send you some postcards, and you can come see it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.